Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Greg Bendian, bringing you central figures to the music that we call progressive, but also anything that's kind of a little bit different musically. We have it here, and I'm very happy to be joined by a special singer, songwriter, drummer, music video director, Kevin Godley of 10CC. Hi, Kevin. Hello. Hi, Greg. How are you? Nice to Great. meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for doing this. You have quite a history in the music, and and a lot of people who watch the show or listen to the show know that that we do like to touch on these uh, precious moments in the the development of music. And I know that you you started out uh, very active in the '60s during really what was an explosion of British music. Um, and you also have a recent album, Muscle Memory, which I definitely want to get into talking about. But I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about growing up where you did and how music became so important to you. It's a good question. I mean, uh, when I was a young boy, the you know, it's a lot. You're talking history. You're talking sepia tone movies here. With crackle all over, you know. Um uh, there wasn't a lot of things to do uh, for people of my age, you know. There was no internet, there was no skateboarding, there were no video games. What there were, however, in Manchester, which is where I grew up, in the north of England, there were lots of clubs, um, you know, lots of coffee bars, lots of clubs, a lot of which had live music going on, and there were also a lot of cinemas where you can go and watch movies. There must have been at least seven cinemas in Manchester, and probably about a dozen clubs, and half of those were featuring live music. So there was a thriving entertainment scene on a number of levels, and I spent my formative years, I guess, initially listening to my parents' taste in music, which wasn't quite what I would hope it would have been, but it was it it got me into sound. Um, and I went looking for other stuff, and my friends were buying records, and I was buying records, and I think the first single record I ever bought was Shazam by Dwayne Eddy, which was great. And... That kind of, I guess, that kind of kick-started an interest in what at that time was the beginning of, I don't know, the beginning of the youth revolution, for want of a better phrase. And for me, that that uh, was amplified by my years at, at art college. The only thing I could do well when I was a kid at school was paint or draw. Um, and hang on a minute, no, dog begging for a treat. I have to uh, in, either edit this out or <laughs> whatever. Okay, here we go. No, oh, there we go. So the only thing I could do was draw. Really, I used to love drawing. Everything else was not much fun at all. And I ended up going to art school for a good many years, which was a very liberating experience because art school was the sort of centre of the explosion. In, in the UK in the sort of middle to late 60s. And there were so many things kicking off at that time. Most notably was, you know, the Beatles and Bob Dylan and a lot of stuff in, in that vein. And it was all pretty revolutionary in comparison to what had been pop music before then. And me and my friends bought into it, and we were excited by it, and we wanted to be part of it, the same as kids want to be part of what's going on today. I don't think we had any any sort of long sighted view of it of doing anything like that for a for a, as a profession. It was just more a vibe. It was more something to do, and. So we just kind of found ways of doing it, I, I guess. I was in maybe two or three bands. Um, when I was at art school, I was in two bands, and I spent most of my time from the mid to the end of the week traveling around England in the back of a shitty old van with a band called the Mockingbirds, 
playing a few gigs, coming back that night, and then going to art school in the morning. And I, you know, it was uh, my mind was seesawing between the two things. One thing I did find out pretty quickly that playing music and gigging was more fun than being at art school. Um, so when I finally left art school with a degree, as one does, um, I, I really didn't have any thoughts about what I should do next because I wasn't, I wasn't sure that I wanted to become a graphic designer, which I'd been trained to be. It seemed like a very sort of dry and sort of predictable thing to do. But I love gigging. I love playing the drums, you know. So I sort of hung on to both at the same time until something eventually matured into something that took off. Um, and I just, I suppose like anything else in life, it, it just happened. And I followed, followed it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, uh, and eventually I sort of looked around and I was a professional musician and thought, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and of course, during those years, we began songwriting. I began songwriting with Laura Cream. Um, and we found that we could, you know, we, we, we didn't probably like so many people then we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and like many bands or many, many songwriters, we were probably trying to sound like people that we admired because, you know, they were the gods. They were, they were the example. So we were kind of trying to sound like them, but it, what you can never do that. And in, in doing so, what happens is something else comes from the process of trying to sound like somebody else that eventually you recognize as sounding like you. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's kind of the story. I don't think it's a unique story by any means. It's, it's, it was done for fun and it turned out to be more fun than anything else. And one day that's what I was doing for a living. <laughs> But it's such a funny thing, Kevin, that comes up time and time again when I speak to musicians is that they're so visually oriented as well. So, mm. so many of the artists I've spoken to came out of art college, uh, yeah. started bands. I mean, you, you can you can just go down the list, but I mean, certainly over here, you know, groups like Devo all meet in college and and yeah and begin this uh, process. And I'm wondering, because you mentioned how this, that moment is everything's exploding, right? Everything is, is uh, very vibrant and people are protesting and there's all sorts of uh, youth movement going on globally. Yeah. And I'm wondering, did the visual work that you do because I know you also have done a, a, an incredible amount of music videos for for famous artists like you two and uh, Kate Bush, Jean Michel Jarre, Phil Collins. Did your visual world influence your musical world at any point at the beginning or since? They ne they never crossed over. Uh, I think they did uh, to a certain extent. Within within ten CC, um, particularly from the second album onwards, and I, but I think it was in the in the songs that we wrote, they were they were very visual songs, and I think that was because uh, Lola and myself came from a, a, a visual background, and we felt that maybe one day we could make pictures, we could we could make films of some description, but we didn't have the tools then. Uh, all we had access was to sound, so we we wrote and recorded songs that sounded like it had something to say visually. I, you know, that's the only way I can, I, I can explain it. But the odd thing is that we never applied our visual thinking to a presentation of the band. We never really got into 
slave sets and clothes and and that whole side of us. We 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 were four very sort of ordinary looking guys from Manchester, uh, but we never we never took that on. Whereas you know, so our contemporaries like like Roxy Music also with an art school background to some degree applied oh, it. Yeah, Bowie very much so. Uh, applied it very much to what they were doing. They realised that that was a key part of music at that particular point in time. I mean, and they were absolutely right. I mean, Elvis wouldn't have been Elvis without the way Elvis looked and how Elvis moved and how Elvis carried himself. That that There would be no Elvis. If Elvis looked like Woody Allen, there would have been no Elvis. <laughs> if that makes any sense. That's quite an image. Even if he sounded like Elvis. <laughs> Did you enjoy 10CC as a live band, though? Yes, I mean, but we we weren't we weren't really a live band. We were a live band because that was part of the deal. You know, uh, you have to go out and promote the albums that you make. Um, a lot of bands started as a live band and added recording to their remit but we were the other way around we were we were we were scientists in the studio you know we were journalists using sound it was and that was our home a little room without any windows and a big mixing desk that was those were our tools and going live was a challenge i i enjoyed it when we did it well but we 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 weren't built for live i don't think and we ended up supporting a lot of people, particularly in America, who were. Uh, I remember we supported Johnny Winter at some gig, and we supported 10 years after at some gig. And it was like a complete mismatch. <laughs> it was so bizarre. Um, we weren't really a live band. Mm. But you took on what I find to be a a visual type of sound production that really, it, I mean, honestly, doesn't it go back to British radio and the Goon Show and George Martin producing um, theater for the radio and the, and the the ear becoming the eye in that situation? Yeah, particularly if that's all you've got. You you, you and look, don't forget during that period of time the actual technology was changing all the time. You know, when we started recording, we had a, it was a four track machine. Uh, and by the time we were, we concluded, it was, you know, 24 to 48 tracks, even though we were still on tape. And numerous plugins and numerous extra bits and bobs you could add to that process. And again, you can thank the Beatles and George Martin for, for opening that up probably more than anybody, um, the possibilities of what you could do and, the, and the, the sense of experimenting with those tools. That was that was thrilling. The, the fact that, I mean, I always look at, I look at a big mixing desk from those days and I always used to see it almost like the flight deck of Concord. And Concord is built to take you places. And I kind of figured that this thing was also built to take you places as well. And that's kind of how we how we felt about it. We because we were working out of Manchester up north, we didn't have record company executives coming round every week to see how we were getting on and saying, well, actually. You can't really. That's wouldn't. That's not going to fly as a chorus. Or you can't say that. Or why are you writing a song about that? That didn't happen. We probably because our first single was a hit. We had a little bit of kudos that we built on gradually, and we were allowed to develop at our own pace. And essentially, the record label got what they were given every mm -hmm. time we did an album. It spoiled us a bit, you know, but but it was it was also gratifying to be able to work like that. Yeah, you've sort of proven your uh, proven your case, and then you can go on and continue to do these things. So many bands that don't have that that first hit 
end up struggling with exactly what you're talking about with the execs coming around and saying, why don't you use this guy, use this producer, use this songwriter, but you guys were self-contained. Four songwriters. Totally self-contained. Yeah, four songwriters, uh, four producers, four singers, four players, four years, four albums. <laughs> okay. Four seems to be significant though. <laughs> yeah. But but Godly Cream goes on, and uh, I wonder if you could talk about that transition from sort of having had enough of 10CC and, and going on with Lull. Well, Godly and Cream existed before 10CC, not as a successful unit, but as a, as a songwriting partnership and as a fledgling recording partnership, but didn't come to fruition until 10CC existed. So, I mean, in the very early years of 10CC, or slightly before 10CC, we invented this device called the Gizmotron, which was a thing that you strapped to your guitar and played the strings supposedly like a string section. And we used it a number of times in 10CC, but we didn't use it extensively. And we felt that we'd never really given it a chance to fly. And we had this idea of doing a, a, an album so to see what this thing could actually do. And the plan was when when 10CC had a break, I think this was this was after the original soundtrack album. We thought we'd just have a little break for a while because <laughs> we were doing the rounds, we were recording, we were touring, we were recording, we were writing, we were recording, we were touring. It was just, you know... Um, and we thought, well, why don't we go in the studio and start recording with this device and see what we can what we can come up with? Can and I we inter- did, and we had. Can, a- can I interrupt you though? Because yes, of course. I have very vivid memories of being a young musician, reading all the trade magazines and seeing yeah. ads for Godly and Cream's Gizmotron. Gizmotron, right? What the hell was it? Was it it? Okay, it was uh, about as analog as Leonardo da Vinci uh, in that it was a series of wheels, tiny little wheels with a sort of serrated edge around one side of the wheel. Uh, And there was a wheel for each string. And it was driven by a long wheel (laughs) attached to an electric motor. So these wheels essentially vibrated against the strings and plucked them extremely quickly. That was the theory. Um, But the materials and the technology we had in those days didn't always work. The, The actual device itself was prone to atmospheric changes, temperature changes, and had to be constantly calibrated with Allen keys and stuff. It was pretty primitive in its way. And having an electric motor on top of a guitar didn't really help. So So on the the bridge? At the bridge, mounted over the bridge, covered, so you can't actually see the the wheels, but you get, you pressed, there was a little sort of plastic thing above the wheels and you pressed each one down on the string. There was a spring behind each one, so it would press down. You hold it, and spring, or you could press all of them down and spring back up. <laughs> so this gave you a, a sustained sort of very rapid tremolo sound. Well, it was it was kind of like a string section because a guitar has strings. So it's yes, in a word. So it's a kind of a bowing, if if not yes. uh, plectral. Yeah. But they were soft. There was oh, sort soft. of multiple soft plectrums vibrating and, and rotating very quickly against each string. And who came up with this? We did. I Me mean, and Law Cream. You and you and Law were were mechanically working on this thing. We didn't build it. We didn't build. Well, the first <laughs> the first version of the Gizmotron or the Gizmo, as we called it then, was um, was a drill a normal household drill with the bit removed and uh, an eraser on the end. 
a pencil eraser that was held against Lowell Stratocaster um, to see what would happen if the theory had any merit whatsoever. And it did for about six seconds. <laughs> um, and we thought, hmm, what we did eventually, we went to, we found somebody at the Manchester College of Science and Technology who, who, who assessed the idea and came up with a way to make it work more efficiently than an India rubber on the end of a drill and built a prototype. And the prototype is what we used to record consequences, the, the album that we're about to talk, to, uh, talk about. But what, what unfortunately happened is, as I was saying, well, we spent three weeks in Strawberry Studios playing with this thing and seeing what it was capable of and had such a great time doing it. Um, we didn't want to go back and pick up the pop song mantle immediately um, because this was something new. This was something different. And that's always what um, excited us more than anything else. We, we, we didn't see it as a career, you see. It was, this, was, this was something we liked to do. We loved doing it. It was an art form. So when we found something that extended that art form, we wanted to do it for a bit longer. So the idea was for Lowell and I to do a solo album, single solo album, and then go back to the fold, as it were. But that wasn't, that wasn't to be because, you know, we were due to do another album. I follow it up with the tour and the usual the usual pattern of events. So the you know push came to shove essentially. We um, I remember we we all went back to the studio one night and Eric and Graham played one of the songs that they'd written to start the new album. I forget what the song was. But we didn't like it. Um, at all and the thought of it felt like it was a step backwards for us and there was one other thing that happened uh, we, we had a meeting uh, I suppose you would call it a pre-production meeting before we began work on How Dare You album and it was really it was it was like well we need we need a couple of interesting godly and cream songs that you know sort of like big, long, strange ones. And then we need a couple of love songs and a couple of funny ones and, you know, a couple of up-tempo. And it, it was like, hang on a minute. That's not how we worked before. The way we traditionally had worked was the album that we were about to do was essentially what we managed to accomplish in about three months. That was kind of the discipline we gave ourselves there was no sense of we had to do this or had to do that. And when it suddenly became, these became the marching orders, for want of a better phrase, it was like, hang on a minute, what if we don't come up with any weird long ones or any love songs? Or It was a career, mm. suddenly, which, which for myself and Lol, who were sort of ingrained experimentalists, again, having come from art school, blah de blah and it was uncomfortable, and we, you know, we took the decision to walk away. That that's essentially it. And the first project we did was this, in hindsight, disastrous album Why called so? Consequences, because it was a triple album that took about fourteen months to two years to record. We didn't quite know what we were doing. We just knew we were having a ball. So oh, it was very indulgent in, in that respect. But the thing that killed it more than anything else was, was the timing. Because probably about halfway through, we're talking 1976, 77, you know, uh, tectonic plates were shifting out there in the world of music. And uh, we emerged into the cold light of day with a triple album where punk had taken over. We were like Japanese soldiers who'd been lost in the forest during the Second World War. 
we didn't know what had hit us. Actually, we kind of did. We knew what was going on, but it was too late to stop and change course. I mean, you must have so, seen punk going on in Manchester, like all we weren't in. We weren't in Manchester anymore by that time. Okay. By then, oh, I tell a lie. Of course we were. Of course we were. But. By the time we were halfway through, we were recording in Oxford. We were no longer recording in Manchester. And we were staying over at the Manor recording studios. Um, we weren't actually, at, we knew what was going on. And something was saying, we've taken a wrong turn here. Although it didn't matter at the time. We felt we were doing something significant, a meisterwork and all that bollocks that, that went along with that progressive period of time where everything had to be treated that way or other people were treating it that way. And we sort of slipped into that mode without initially wanting to. It became, it's something that took over. It took over us and it took over, it got had a new, it's a lot, had a life of its own. But doesn't the muse uh, take over, Kevin? Sorry? Doesn't the muse take over? Yeah, but the yeah, but the muse took over, but the, the, the weed also took over and the record company also took over and said, Listen, we think what you're doing is great, but it's gotta stop <laughs> at some point. So they came up with this ingenious idea of having us work with uh, Peter Cook, the, uh, the you know, the well-known genius humorist uh, at the time, which was great fun. But again, and they probably thought he was much more of an adult than we were, and he will be a steadying influence on our excess. But the opposite was the case. We were as bad as each other sometimes. Um, how, probably... how does Peter Cook f f figure into the... your stuff? He doesn't, but he, in this project he did, he wrote a play where he played all the characters in, in the play, except for the female role, and it included the music that we were making. So it became a sort of musical, pl musical play. I mean, it was a great thrill to work with Peter. Was it fun? Oh, it was great fun, but, but too much fun, because he would get up early in the morning, and he'd he'd be you know he'd be drunk by lunchtime. We'd get up by eleven o'clock, and we'd be in sync with Peter until lunchtime. He would retire, and we'd carry on till three in the morning. By which time we were stoned out of our brains. Um, so and we do this. So in other words, there'd be about two or three hours a day where we were in sync. And, you know, looking back on it now, it's two spoilt musicians given the opportunity to waste a huge amount of money in lots of big studios and record a pile of tripe, uh, some of which sounds really interesting, but would have been better served had it been on the original idea of a single experimental album. And finally, it was released as a triple box set, selling for £12 in a world of punk and it didn't go well, is all I can say. Let me just close that door. It's bloody good. Uh, what was interesting is um, somebody made a cinema commercial for Benson and Hedges cigarettes, and a piece of music from side one of Consequences was chose, chosen to go with that 90 second cinema commercial. So suddenly we found ourselves doing music for film, little realizing that in a couple of years' time we'd be doing film for music. But it's sort of those two elements started to subconsciously blend at that point. And that was probably the best thing that came out of the whole project, other than getting to work with people like Peter Cook and Sarah Vaughan and things like that. Um, but after after that, whole thing settled down, we started making smaller records <laughs> as Godly and Green from a local studio, 16-track studio, that was where the police recorded their first three albums. 
great little studio. Uh, and we got our heads back in shape. We understood where we'd gone wrong and uh, we went off and dreamed it all up all over again. You know? So I'm very curious because you're one of the kinds of artists that's straddled pop music, uh, progressive music, art rock, all of these things. Uh, who, besides the Beatles, Kevin, who, who, who were the experimentalists that inspired you, that excited you? And, and it could even be visual arts. Goodness me. Well, I, you know, you mentioned Devo. I love Devo. Uh, but Kate Bush, probably in that period. And you got to work uh, with her. We did. We we did a music video for Kate and Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel being another one. I mean, I, the interesting thing about these these people is that I don't think they believe in genres. It's it's and and I I don't I never did. It's it's a matter of creating something that. It exists, but how do you define it? It doesn't matter how you define it. That is sales talk. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, someone's talks to me about drum and bass. I say, well, okay, have you got any piccolo and um, piccolo and oboe records? And what are you talking about? But those are just ways to define it for people. But when when I'm actually working or writing or recording, it's, it's irrelevant to me what. I also have no idea what it is supposed to sound like. It's always a surprise when I come up with, or the people I'm working with come up with something that sounds right for that piece of material. It doesn't matter what it, how you define it. But all the elements you're talking about um, do kind of come together. They, I think there is a certain degree of respect for a good hook in a song if it comes along uh, you're not going to throw it out because it's too poppy you just you just include it into the way you think about things and the way you work with things it's things either work for it or, or you don't and that's down to your own sensibility about the um, the discipline so you were never messed about with by producers you were always just off doing your own thing always always so how did you make <laughs> the transition from uh music for film to film for music video because uh, because we were essentially dipping back into that thing i spoke about earlier where we were two songwriters in a band who didn't have the tools to make film. So we wrote things that sounded like film. Now, suddenly, we may have the opportunity, if we're lucky, to actually make films of music that other people have made. How do you go about it? Well, you come at it from a musical perspective. We came at it from the perspective of listening to what somebody had done and trying to figure out images that captured that piece of music in pictures. And we avoided, we always avoided, and I still do, telling a story because when people listen to music, they add their own pictures to the stuff. It's a love story. They don't want to see the singer's love. They want to think of their own love, if that's what it's about, and their own experience. Uh, and to me, to do that kind of a narrative for a music video just clouds the issue. So I always and we always used to come up with ideas that were probably more abstract, uh, more more general, um, and more interesting. More more interesting. So it's not. It wasn't really a matter of trying to do a painting. It was a matter of trying to come up with a perfect postage stamp because these were things that lasted for three and a half, four minutes. It's, I mean, you know, there are some, I mean, Thriller was a story. Philip Thriller worked, 
but it was what, 20 minutes long and it was made by a consummate filmmaker. But we weren't that kind of a filmmaker. We had no grounding in film. Mm. At the very beginning, we didn't know a video camera from a film camera. Mm. So we had to we had to make it up as we went along. And we were lucky in that we we got to make a Godly and Cream record uh, into a video. Uh, we wanted to do it ourselves, but we weren't allowed to by the label because we had no experience. They got a, a director and had done it before to do it. And we learned from that one experience that this we felt that this was something that we could do. And we got very involved in the edit side of it and learned a hell of a lot about editing and effects and and so on and so on. And the record did very well in Europe called An Englishman in New York, the track. It's our first half or co-directed music video. Um, and that was that was how it all began. Again, sort of, I guess it was meant to be, but it was a natural exchange, if you like. It was, if there's a seesaw and music's on one side and video's on the other, there was a while where it was like that, then it went boom, and the video was uppermost. <laughs> Uh, and that was a great time. I'd love to hear some stories because I know you you did a number of videos with you too, right? And Bono. Yeah. Yes. They were they I that was probably one of my favorite periods as a solo director. Um because they are very, very, very knowledgeable about everything that they do. They understand the power of video, what it can in fact do. And they gave me a lot of leeway to come up with things um, that were different, that were unusual. Um, the first one I did for them was for um, even better than the real thing. And because the, the music had such momentum, I wanted to come up with a way of looking at them that gave you a sense of that momentum, that spinning feeling. Um, and I invented this rig along with a company in, in the UK who built it to do that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, with the, with the video at all. Yeah, the Karen. The 360 rig, yeah. And that was, that was kind of the basis of it. And what was great, because they are consummate performers, particularly Bono, they... On the day of the shooting, that sequence, they all knew how to use the camera. It was an instinctive how to perform to a camera that was spinning above them and then below them and then round behind them and over the front of them. They knew how to get the most out of that shooting situation, which was a, which was a joy. Um, and everything we did from that point was always, I mean... One thing I learned about you working with you two is that they they all, because they're so uh, knowledgeable about this aspect of, of their presentation, lots of meetings take place. We have lots of meetings to hash out what's good, what's bad, what should what should we do, what should we avoid. But again, that's always that's always very healthy. And a lot of times when you come up with an idea for an artist or a band, you, you write a treatment, you put it in, and then you have a cursory conversation with somebody, and they say, no, don't want to do that. I want to be in it more. Or that's crap, I've come up with something else. But they're the only uh, band that I've worked with, really, who, had, who as, as a matter of course, equally, each member of the band, uh, had intelligent things to say about what was being proposed. And all, it was always for the better what we came up with. So you, are you storyboarding when you, when you're having these meetings? Are you, are you drawing? Are you showing them your ideas? No, because it's, it, they're early meetings. They usually, it's usually to hash out the kind of thing. But do you we, storyboard? We, sometimes. Depends what it is. I storyboard if it's something that is exact 
that the, the, my DLP needs to understand um, that we're going to move this way and it has to look like this. But what I do probably more often than not is create a set of circumstances that allows me to get a load of stuff that I know I can make something really interesting from. In other words, a sort of umbrella concept. Um, it's interesting that because of the meeting, uh, I'm trying to remember what track it was for. Well, I, don't, I don't know if it was for Numb or if it was for Sweetest Thing. It's for one of those two videos. The initial idea was the band was going to be at the barbers having their hair cut. And uh, and we talked about it and we talked about it, but it didn't it didn't seem to go anywhere, other than the band having shorter hair or, or whatever or getting it wrong. Or <laughs> so this other this other idea developed, uh, and again I'm not sure if it was numb or if it was I think it was sweetest thing. Sweetest thing was essentially numb on wheels. Um, it was essentially a locked off shot that took place with various things happening throughout the length of the song. Um, but this time it was supposedly in the back of a horse drawn carriage in Dublin. Um, but the, this is how this is how things develop. And each person you work with at a video level gives you uh, a different approach to your process. What was the process for the uh, Bono Frank Sinatra video? Um, essentially, grab what we could um, and make something of it later. The, the, the initial idea <laughs> um, through a guy that was sort of that was Frank's big friend, uh, where he lived in Palm Springs. He was our kind of main man, organizer. He suggested a, a club in uh, Palm Springs uh, that we could use to film Frank. But he, he wasn't really a, very au fait with, with music video as a form. So the idea was, um, I think um, Anton Corbin came with us on that particular jaunt with a view of taking pictures of the two of them together. And I think it was kind of, that was kind of a decoy, in a way. Um, the idea, the original idea, was that uh, I think that Bono would be at the bar, and Frank would arrive with a bottle of great Irish whiskey and give it to him, and we would take photographs of the two of them. That was going to be photographed, but what we'd done, we'd positioned small what they call lipstick cameras all the way round the bar um, and hope to catch whatever want, went on between them, a conversation between them. Um, is, this because what, you, is this because you were told not to direct Mr. Sinatra? Yeah, yeah kind of. <laughs> kind of. Um, but it was disaster. I mean, we were, you know, we introduced ourselves. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Like, Hi, nice to meet you and all that. Uh, and then so he comes in and he, and he, he you know we had a we had a camera pointing at a specific bar stool in front of the bar so he comes in and we're all cameras are rolling secretively we're all hiding on the tables and shit and cameras are rolling he comes in and he moves the bar stool a foot to his right and sits down so all the cameras you can't pan with these cameras they're locked off we got the back of his head on that camera <laughs> and on another camera we got his foot and we got a bit of bono and he's like on we had like 15 cameras with fuck all worthwhile on any of them so and this was going on so you know the ad yells cut and i have to go over and explain what's really happening to frank and it was, it was, uh, it was bizarre. I, you know, see, I, I, how do you do a thing that was great? Was great. Can we, can we do that again, please? Why? Because 
<clears throat> we're filming you. What? What's it for? It's a music video. What's that? <laughs> and then, you know, the whole situation had to be explained. Excuse me, reminding and, and me of it. Did he escalate or was he cool? No. He, 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 okay, we did it one more time with Frank at the bar, solidly in shot on all cameras. And Bono came in and gave him a bottle of Irish whiskey. And we got that. But again, something horrible happened in the, it's very hot in Palm Springs. And by then we jettisoned all the lipstick cameras and we were shooting on 60 millimeter film and it jammed, the camera jammed. So it's, I've cut Mr. Sinatra. Yes, it's me again. Would you mind doing that one more time? Why? And he then turns to his mate and says, why, 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 what is this? How's the record doing? It's doing really well. Well, why are we doing this shit? I'm out of here. And he split. He left. So what you see of that meeting is bits of bits of one take if I remember think, things correctly. The rest of the video, we kind of had to cobble together on the spot. Um, there was film that they acquired, and I don't think it was done while we were there. Apparently, Bono took a ride in the back of a limousine with Frank at some point. That piece of footage was found. Any stuff that we could find of Frank archive footage singing the same song we acquired that we spent a day in the studio where i was writing the lyrics on some people's arms and then we went for a ride in the back of an open top mercedes with bono driving around palm springs and ended up in some bizarre dinosaur park which was terrifying not the dinosaurs bono driving um and that was what we went home with this this stuff with no real idea of how it would all fit together. Um, and we, we, you know, we spent a couple of days, you know, trying to cut it together, mix it together, rip it in half, stick this bit there, move things around. And it was fine. It was fine. It just had no style. It had no approach. And then I, I, I had a one of those ding moments, you know, light bulb moments, where I kind of figured, well, what if we had two TV monitors next to each other in the edit suite, and we played this bunch of footage on that side, on that monitor, and another bunch of footage on the other side, had these two monitors playing at the same time, and we used one of these lipstick cameras. They're only about so big. And I would move around the actual monitors while you're playing it, while it's being played. Um, and I think we played it in double speed on both monitors in sync and shot at 50 frames per second so that the movement was relatively smooth, but everything was in real time. Hmm. And once we once we discovered that, it added that extra dimension to the finished piece. That was the way it worked. But up to that point, it was it was just footage with no form, no no nothing, no glue to hold the idea together. And that's that's sometimes how it works. That you, something you had no idea about this. You've got a landfill of footage and you do not know what to do with it and you are shitting your pants <laughs> did in you every not, possible Did you not do the uh, also the uh, Peter Gabriel, Kate Bush, uh, Don't Give Up video? Yeah, yes. Was, was that your visual idea for that? That's such a striking video. That was a Godly and Cream video. That was way back in those days. And... What we saw when we heard the video, uh, sorry, when we heard the track, was was the two of them just holding on to each other. That was the image that immediately came to mind, the idea of it being against an eclipse also felt relevant 
because it was about it was about losing something and finding a way back to it again, which is what happens when you watch an eclipse. Something disappears and then reappears and is whole again. And that that felt pertinent as well. Um, the tricky bit was okay, how if they're holding on to each other, how do we see one of them and then the other? when it's their turn to do a verse. So we had them on a slowly rotating plinth, plinth which, which you don't see. Um, it was it a was pretty simple shoot. It was essentially a one-off shoot against a green screen or blue screen. And the eclipse was, was built in post-production. Not very well, looking back at it, but it's, it's the best we could do with the tech at the time. But it captured captured the vibe and they both did their performances were, were incredibly affecting well they're both clearly very uh dramatic performers and yeah. and both had a lot of experience in the visual aspect of of their performance i'm curious you know what it was like with with kate bush and and working with her and, and her whole sense of how things should go and things should look because i mean i think it would be fair to say she was very much a control freak in her work as was gabriel and so many of you guys but yeah what was it like with kate it was the same as it, as it was with peter they 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 bought into the concept of it and naturally, when we when we'd done takes, we would play the takes back to them uh, with the video feed that we had, and you know they'd say, "Oh, I think I can do this better. Let me do that again," as if we were if we were making a movie, and we wanted the performers to see how good they were, or if there was anything that was needed to be changed. Um, no, there was there was no control freakery at all. Maybe because the idea was so simple, there wasn't that there wasn't that much to discuss. I'm pretty sure we 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 talked about it uh, a lot up front before we actually put the production together, and it was very simple. You know, maybe what they were wearing or that, but it it wasn't really that important because it was about the emotional the emotional connection between them and that sense of loss. And, and finding finding oneself again, and they both did it in, incredibly well. It's interesting how even when you think about Bowie's Heroes video, how simple that is. Yeah, and the idea that there's a very simple visual: let the song do the work. Yeah, don't get in the way. No, but with people like with people like Bowie. And with people like Peter and with Kate, there is something worth looking at. You know, so even if you have the bare bones of a performance, you know that you're going to get a performance worthy of the camera. You know, so, I mean, that is something, again, that is always important to me. If, the, if, if you're dealing with an artist that works with a camera well, trust that arrangement. You know, don't come up with too many other bits and pieces and mad shit to cover that up. Let it be driven by something that's that's authentic and build around it, not over it. That's a great rule of thumb for any production. I think so. I think so. And sound as well. I mean, it's the same. It's the same stuff, isn't it, really? Yes. Whether it's in pictures or whether it's, it's the same stuff, it's just that you mold it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Same issues, right? Color, texture, mm. foreground, background. Yeah, exactly. Center. It's it's all the same. I talk about this a lot in my in my music production class at the university, but it really is. Oh, you do a music production class? That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. How do people respond to that? How do students respond to that? It opens their ears to listening in a way that they had never thought of before. A kind, I teach a kind of three-dimensional listening. So there's, what does that mean? 
top, bottom, left, right, center, foreground, background, you got a bit of a sound box up there. And okay. Where you, and this, of course, I mean, this is a great uh, reference too, is um, I'm not in love. When I'm listening, right. I'm not in love. I have so much imagery in my mind because of the placement of sounds and the placement of the background vocals, which kind of remind me of, of the high Linda vocals on Uncle Albert, where they're just sort of out in this at, and creating an atmosphere. So we talk a lot about atmosphere. We talk a lot about point of view uh, in terms of sound, you know, what who's who's in front, who's in back, what's dry, what's wet. You know, all the, all those things you have to do with with uh, maybe yeah. a successful sound world, you know. I made a video for I'm not in love. Oh, Strangely yeah. enough. Which scared the hell out of me. I was asked uh, Graham Goulman takes a, a touring version of 10 CC out every year. And they're very good, but they wanted to have something on the screen at the back of the stage while that song was being performed. And I was kind of scared of it because it's so iconic in our canon, you know? So we should check it out. It's, it's nothing you would expect. <laughs> But it is a song everybody knows, and it's iconic. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is. It is. Uh, it, I suppose to many, many people, it defines us at our peak. It might be the one most people would know, yeah. Yeah. But that idea, too, of, um, of how the sound is asking to be treated... Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, this. I have this thing that I talk about a lot with my students, which is uh, the material tells you what it needs. This didn't. This didn't. Um, at least it didn't the first time around. Our first attempt to record I'm Not In Love was hopeless. We did it as a sort of cheesy bossa nova thing, loungy kind of piece of music and it was it was shit for want of a better word it was also we so we shelved it. uh when we were making our way through the original soundtrack album we shelved it i think it was one of the one of the early ones we tried and it was a complete failure and we knew it was but people around the studio were humming it so we knew it was a good song and we decided we come back to it when we were further in the album and we discovered more about uh, the way we were heading and I had this I had this idea that it should all be done with voices probably out of desperation trying to come up with another way of approaching it and it worked out really well <laughs> but it it could have gone in another direction entirely and it's one of those situations maybe it's instinct or something or, or you come up with a with a with a mad idea that is just so crazy that it might work. And sometimes it's crazy enough to work. And in this in this context, it, it, it really did. So we were lucky. We were lucky. But it was never planned like that. So who did the vocal arranging? It wasn't arranged in the normal. What we did was we treated the mixing desk as a kind of Mellotron with phasers. And we did that by recording by myself, Graham, and Lol, singing a single note for as long as we could um, onto every track of a 24 four-track machine. And then we'd mix that down to two-inch tape and create a loop out of it. It's like music for airports, kind of bringing... It's, yes. We did, yeah. Again, I think we would delay. You know, we, we made it last as long as possible because we didn't know whether it would work. And it it probably took us about three weeks to record everything that we needed. Um, but then we fed these loops one by one back onto the twenty four track machine, to, and then we assigned them to faders on the keyboard. So you, if, you, if you move these, you would get this chord. 
if you move these, you would get the other, uh, the other. And then we put a piece of tape along the bottom, uh, just below the faders. So they were never all completely out. They were all there. There's a strange sort of atonal hum going on. Uh, and we were all assigned a number of faders, and at the right point, we'd push them up. Uh, then Lol would push some up, and then Graham, and then Eric would push. It was pretty mental. It was a mad way of working. But that's why it sounds like you don't hear anyone, anyone breathing, because no one is. It's just a sound that sounds like some celestial choir somewhere. Um, but that's how it was done. Very, very sort of technical and calculated, but the loops were very long. They would go round a spool and then round a mic stand and a cymbal stand and someone standing there with a pencil and then back onto the machine again. So that the join where the loop meets the loop was different on every one and would gradually disappear when the mass was being played. So, so that was the technique. And the backing track was all recorded in the control room. Uh, with a rhythm guitar, electric piano, and me playing the Moog synth bass drum sound. And that's all that's there. And the, and the lead vocal was the guide vocal that Eric sang as a guide at that time. We never changed that. It's such a striking piece, and, and in a way takes it to another level with that middle section. Yeah. I'm wondering whose idea was uh, Big Boys Don't Cry? Well, originally, there's a, there is a middle eight in the song. Yes. And it, it occurs twice. Right. But we didn't want to repeat it the second time. We wanted it just to hang, but with something going on. And we had this phrase that was, big boys don't cry, big, but we didn't know. It wasn't going to be one of us that said it. And the, the lady who was the studio secretary at the time stuck her, stuck her head in, in the door and said, Eric, there's someone on the phone for you. And we went, that's the voice. So we persuaded, we persuaded Kathy, her name was, and we persuaded her to, to put the headphones on and come around the microphone and record it. It's, just, it's as simple as that. It was, and it's, it's become a sort of classic moment. Kathy, the secretary, immortal. Yeah. Ex yes, exactly. And it was just because she said, Eric, there's someone on the phone for you. <laughs> that wouldn't have worked as an alternative piece of dialogue, I don't think. Yeah, it's 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 quite it's quite a big a quite a big piece, I think, actually, for, for a pop song. You know, there there are those that's that achieving sort of that Beatle thing where you don't really know how long it is in time, in actual time. I, I'll play my class, Uncle Albert, and I'll say to them, how long do you think that was? And they have yeah. no idea. I mean, they think it's much longer than it is because it has such an uh, uh, immersive effect. Yeah, yeah. And you guys do, yeah. you know, uh, and you do that not just with that song, but with time and time again, because it, I think it goes back to this idea of the sound world, the you know, being immersed in what that sound world is that's important you 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 have the you have the tools to create any kind of place any kind of environment that you want to listen to it's just sometimes you're luckier than others in finding something that is so energized and so pretty or haunting that it it sort of it works outside the studio walls. <laughs> it, it touches people, and it, that doesn't happen that often. Those all those sessions around that particular song were all magical sessions. Everything we tried made it better. Whereas so many tracks you work on, that's a piece of shit. That's great. No, it's not. The next day, you're playing a bum note there. Do it again. That happens all the time, obviously, but not with this track. So much to talk about there, but but before uh, we go on too long, I did want to ask you about Muscle Memory, which is a recording okay. you made uh, a few years ago, 
Yeah. And uh, still kind of fresh because it, it kind of must have happened right around the time of COVID that it came out. So it did. Yeah. T- t- tell us a little bit about Muscle Memory. I think it's such a cool album. Thank you. Appreciate that. I was, you know, I think once a songwriter and recording artist, always is a songwriter and recording artist. You know, when you stop for a while, you stop for a while, but it, but the need to do that doesn't really go away. And I, I wanted to to make a record. Um, but as a writer, I was used to sitting opposite somebody who played an instrument, a guitar or a keyboard, because I don't play an instrument. I play drums and I sing, but I drums aren't the ideal instrument to write a song to because chords help you find tunes, you know, and find ways through. So I figured, okay, well, because, you know, the internet was becoming more interesting and and, and it was becoming easier to make contact with people, I thought it would be interesting to put an ask out there to see if people would send me pieces of music that they either recorded and didn't know what to do with or record something specially with a thought that I could turn it into a song. Uh, and that could be the basic sort of track I'd be working to. Um, and so that, that, that was, the, that was the, the, the basic conceit of the project. Um, I, I didn't know how many I get, if I get any at all, but I ended up getting a lot more than I anticipated. Um, and so it became a matter of, of going through them and not really, not really thinking which of these is best, which are the best ones. It was which were the ones that I could bring something to. And so I would, I would pick one that I thought would work and I'd pull it into garage band and I'd set up a microphone and I'd start singing over it. And sometimes that worked really well. Uh, and I got something immediately, some vibe, some connection to a piece of music. So, okay, so I I put that to one side and choose another piece. And that's essentially how it works. It was the look of the draw. I listened to everything that I got. And some of them that were fantastic. I never, just never, never managed to do something with them. Uh, and some of them, some of them were awful. <laughs> but And some of them were totally unexpected. But the interesting thing was that they were all in areas of music that I wasn't used to working in. Yes, well, they, it's they did... stylistically diverse recording. To- totally stylistically diverse recording. Some very abstract stuff, um, some sort of country stuff, mm-hmm. some bluesy stuff, some electronica. You, you name it, it was in there. I, I think there was about 300 of them, essentially. Um, but the ones that you hear on the album are the ones that I manage to assimilate and work with and create something that I felt was was what I wanted to say at the time. And, and I didn't know what I wanted to say at the time until I began to say it. And I was being influenced by what was going on in the world because we were it was it wasn't lockdown time yet. But COVID was around pretty much and everyone was talking about it. And, you know, we knew something radical would have to happen soon. So the process of doing this was 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 a good idea in that I was working with people that I'd never met, uh, really, for the most part, um, and I didn't need them there. Can you tell us work. some of the folks who they were? I... I've met. I'm the only person that I'd met before. I'm trying to think who who it was. Who was I met before? Jesus, my memory not so good. Most, I'd say, ninety nine percent of the people I ended up working with, I had never met before. They were just people who'd sent me things, hmm. and and then we met on email and we met via the phone. Zoom didn't exist yet, so. That wasn't possible. 
And I got to know these people at the time. It was great. Now, were you doing lyrics for these? What were you you uh, coming up I with? I was top line and lyrics, the song, essentially, uh, and performing them. And how long did the process take? I mean, there, you had so many different elements. Question. <laughs> uh, probably about a year, all told, from, from first acquiring um, the music to listening to it, trying things, deciding which tracks I'm going to be working on, take to completion, doing rough versions of things that I had in mind and sharing those initial audio thoughts with the person who sent me that particular track uh, and getting feedback and then carrying on and taking it to some kind of finished conclusion. Yeah, it's probably getting on for a year, mm. I would imagine, with breaks in between for certain things to happen. For instance, the original website I went with, the idea went... Uh, uh, it failed. The website failed and then went out of business, essentially. And uh, I then had to go and find a record label to pick up the, the same idea. Uh, and I did uh, with 51 State Conspiracy. They were very supportive and gave me a little bit of money to finish the process. So there was a pause. Um, but I, I I found it incredibly liberating. The whole it was like writing with somebody opposite you, except they weren't in the room, and they were playing a bunch of instruments at the same time instead of one. So you had a much fuller, a much fuller template to be working with, a much an already partially painted canvas to be adding your parts to, and. Um, and I didn't have to make them coffee every ten minutes. Yeah. So you know, it was uh, it was great. It was very it was great. And what was exciting to me is that I found my own voice for the first time. I'd never been a solo artist on anything before. It had always been in conjunction with either one other person or a, or a band. So this was the first time I'd had a chance to contribute in, in this way as a songwriter, if you know what I mean, without the encumbrance of saying, no, it should be about this, or no, that's not a good way to say that, or the usual, the usual back and forth wasn't there. How'd you like that? I loved it. I got spoiled by it. I mean, I was hoping that, that I'd send stuff to the, these people and say, yeah, but that's all right. But I didn't get any buts, which was which was amazing, actually. They were they were all um, they were all very happy with the with the with the early sketches that I sent them. So and they said just carry on and do it, which I did, of course, I you know. <laughs> Before we got to to mixing or anything, I'd, we'd we talk again and we'd share uh, them again, and always they were very they were very happy. Well, I, I think it's a fascinating album, and I encourage people to find Kevin Godley's Muscle Memory. Kevin, where where can people find this recording? If you go on to Fifty One State Conspiracy website, they're selling it. I think it probably may it may also be available on Amazon. I'm not 100 percent sure, but it's it's. I mean, they're a small independent label, very supportive of um, art projects, or shall we say, what they consider to be valuable. Uh, not valuable. That's the wrong word, but worthwhile pieces of music, and they obviously felt the same about this. Well, substance. You know, it's. Um... It's easy maybe to write ditties, but to write an art song or to write something, you know, relevant, that's that's already a, a kind of outside of commercial bounds these days. Well, at the time I was writing, there were all sorts of things kicking off. You know, Charlottesville 
kicked off when I was writing and uh, the song All Bones Are White came out of that, learning about that and, and the rise of the alternative right in America and Trumpism, the megalomaniac himself. Um, that whole thing was kicking off. Mm -hmm. And it's it's horrible for the world, but it's 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 jewelry for songwriters. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's gold for songwriters. Unfortunately, that is the case. Um, but there was a lot happening around about that time, and I'd never really, I'd never really written about things like that before. Um, and so I just, I think it was because I, the space where I'm talking to you now is my little studio in the house, and I can hear the things on the TV in the next, next room, and the news is coming on and saying this is happening, and Trump is speaking about something, and it was going in. And some of it just came out in the in the tunes. Sure. Well, it's it's um it's a cool record by one of the guys that uh that we, we refer to in the US. You're one of the original cats, if you'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. That's uh, very kind. Been, been there making it happen since the 60s and you are one of the original cats and it's such a pleasure to speak with you kevin thank you for taking this time my pleasure it was it was an interesting conversation sometimes um, these kind of things aren't interesting they're just <laughs> what if what happened then why is that talk about this record this this is a conversation which is much more intelligent i think and, and real I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm so happy that, that you had a good time. Everybody, my guest has been singer, songwriter, music, visualist, Kevin Godley. You know him from 10CC. You love him from all the music and all the videos. And thank you for watching the podcast. We do have a lot more stuff coming up uh, and a lot of innovators, a lot of people who are at the cutting edge of music. And certainly Kevin Godley has always been there. So we'll say goodbye for now. Hit us on Patreon. Always happy to hear from people at my site, bendianmusic.com. Send me your comments. I love to hear from everybody. And we will continue to, to get uh, heavy cats like Kevin Godley on the show. <laughs> heavy Thank cat. You, I'll put that after my name, Kevin Godley. Heavy cat. Heavy. I like that. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Greg. You. See you soon. Bye. Bye, man.